let's look at limits of what are called rational functions. A rational number is any number that can be written as a fraction with an integer in the numerator and an integer in the denominator. Integers, as you may remember, are whole numbers that can be positive, negative, or zero. A rational function is also a fraction, but now the numerator and denominator are polynomials instead of integers. Here's an example of a rational function with a cubic polynomial in the numerator and a quadratic in the denominator. When we graph rational functions, we can get some very interesting behaviors like this, often with horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Next, try playing a bit with graphs of rational functions. Then we'll try to come up with some rules for how they behave as x goes to infinity. Here you can make your own rational function. Choose a polynomial for the numerator, and choose another polynomial for the denominator. When the degree of the numerator is bigger, what happens to the rational function as x gets really big? To help you, you might want to zoom out a little bit before picking an answer. So when you're working this out, make sure that the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. Remember that the degree is the highest power that appears in your polynomial. So this polynomial has a degree of 2, and this polynomial also has a degree of 2. So in this example, the degrees are equal. Pick a polynomial in the numerator that's bigger, and then zoom out and see what happens to the function as x gets really big. Let's think about two functions. Let's say we have y equals 3x squared over 2x plus 1. As x gets really big, this rational function goes to infinity, because the x squared in the numerator is much bigger than the x in the denominator. But let's think about another rational function, y equals minus 3x squared over 2x plus 1. Everything here but the minus sign, if we look at just that, that goes to infinity. And now if we put the minus sign back in, this goes to minus infinity. So it looks like rational functions where the numerator has a higher degree than the denominator can go to plus or minus infinity as x gets really big. Okay, now what happens if the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator? What happens to the function as x gets really big? Okay, this time make sure that the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. And see what happens as x gets really big. You're probably going to want to zoom out again. Good luck. Okay, so if the degrees of the numerator and denominator are now the same, What's the limit of a rational function as x gets really big? Okay, well here's an example where the degrees are the same, they're both 2. So in this example, what's the limit of the function as x goes to infinity? Well, let's take a look. Let's see what happens when x gets really, really big. It looks like this limit is approaching, and it's pretty close to 1. So if we say that this is approaching 1, that's not any of the choices here, so it looks like it's none of the above. Well, let's think about this a little more. As x gets really big, the x squared term gets a lot bigger than this 5, so let's ignore the 5. And in the denominator, x squared gets a lot bigger than minus 20x, and it gets a lot bigger than 1. So this limit approaches x squared over x squared, which equals 1. Now remember, we could have different coefficients here. So we could have, say, 2x squared over 3x squared. This is still a case where the degree of the numerator equals the degree of the denominator. But now this limit, instead of approaching x squared over x squared, approaches 2x squared over 3x squared, which is, the x squareds cancel, 2 thirds. So this limit could really be anything. When the degree in the numerator equals the degree in the denominator, it depends on these coefficients here. So it's not infinity, it's not zero, it's not infinity or minus infinity. It's the ratio of these coefficients, which could be anything. So it's none of the above. Let's summarize what you figured out. 
When you have rational functions like this, as x gets really big, the highest powers of x matter the most. The highest power of x in the numerator here is 3, and in the denominator it's 2. Let's keep those terms and throw away these smaller terms. Now let's try evaluating this simpler limit. x cubed divided by x squared is x, so we're left with the limit of 2x. As x goes to infinity, this expression also goes to infinity. Great, so we've evaluated this limit. Now let's take a quick look at the graph here. It doesn't seem to go to infinity when x gets big. What's going on here? Now we're only looking at a small part of the graph here, between minus 3 and positive 6. Rational functions can do all sorts of crazy things with horizontal and vertical asymptotes. So maybe outside of this range, the function does something like this. We evaluated the limit correctly, so it really should go to positive infinity. So maybe it just takes a little longer before it starts going up to positive infinity. Right, we should have zoomed out before graphing it. The zoomed out graph looks like this, and it definitely goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. The original graph only looked at this small part here. If we had used that smaller graph to guess the limit, we would have gotten it wrong. To summarize, whenever you're taking limits of rational functions as x goes to infinity, focus on terms with the highest powers of x. Then you can simplify things a little more easily. If you're stuck, it never hurts to graph the function. Just be careful to zoom out enough before deciding on an answer. Comparing messy functions to simpler functions can make finding limits easier. The squeeze theorem helps us do that. Let's see an example. Here's the function x squared times the sine of 1 over x, and here's a graph of it. Suppose somebody asked us what happens to this function when x goes to 0. Well, it seems to go to 0 as x gets small, but we can't just plug in 0 because of this 1 over x term here. To figure out this limit, let's start by figuring out some simpler functions to compare f of x to. We'll then use those limits to figure out the limit of f. First. Which of the following functions is always less than f of x? We're looking for a function that's always less than or equal to our function f of x. How can we find it? Well, the first thing that helps is to notice that the sine of anything is called qua is always bigger than or equal to negative 1, less than or equal to 1. So if we multiply this whole thing by x squared, x squared is always a positive number, or 0. We get that minus x squared is less than or equal to x squared times sine of whatever, which is less than or equal to x squared. Here, the whatever happens to be 1 over x, but it could have been anything else. This function here is always bigger than or equal to this function here. So the correct answer is that f of x is always bigger than or equal to minus x squared. Great. So minus x squared is always below this curve, and we know that it goes to 0 as x goes to 0. Now let's find a function that's always greater than f of x. We're looking for a function that's always bigger than f of x. Now this looks like something that should be almost like the one we had before, this minus x squared, except now it's positive, so a good guess is plus x squared. We can prove that by just noting that sine of 1 over x is always going to be less than or equal to 1. And we can multiply both sides by x squared, which is always bigger than or equal to 0. And then we have x squared times sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to x squared. 
Right, x squared is greater than f of x. So now we have a function that's bigger than f everywhere, and another function that's smaller than f everywhere, except for at x equals 0, because we can't put 0 into our blue function. But that's okay, because we want to find the limit as x goes to 0, and that limit only cares about values near 0, not at 0. The squeeze theorem says that if we have an inequality like this, we can take the limit of each term and get another inequality. In other words, if these inequalities are all true everywhere around zero, then they have to be true in the limit as we approach zero. Okay, now try evaluating these outer two limits. There's nothing too complicated going on with these limits. If we have the limit as x approaches zero of x squared, Nothing is complicated about plugging 0 into x squared, so we can just say this is equal to 0 squared, which is 0. The same is true if there's a minus sign here. It would have been a minus 0 squared, and it would also have been 0. So the answer is 0. Right. To find these outer limits, we can just plug in 0. The limit that we're trying to figure out is greater than or equal to zero, but also less than or equal to zero. That doesn't leave a whole lot of choices. It has to be zero. Let's summarize the squeeze theorem. If we're trying to find the limit of a function f that's sandwiched between two functions g and h everywhere except the point we care about, and if the limit of g and the limit of h both go to the same value, let's call it l, then the limit of f will be squeezed by g and h and forced to the same value l. As long as we pick simpler functions to squeeze between, this will allow us to figure out tricky limits. Why don't you give squeezing one last try before we finish? What's the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times the cosine of 1 over x plus 1? We can use the squeeze theorem here. If we have x squared times cosine of 1 over x plus 1, the cosine, like the sine, is always going to be between negative 1 and 1. So this whole expression is going to be less than or equal to x squared plus 1, and it's going to be bigger than or equal to minus x squared plus 1. The minus x squared comes from setting the cosine to negative 1, and the plus x squared comes from setting the cosine to 1. The limits on the left and right are easy to calculate. As x goes to 0, this thing goes to 1. And as x goes to 0, this thing also approaches 1. So the limit in the middle is squeezed to be 1. Let's take a look at a challenging trigonometric limit. Here it is, the limit of sine x over x as x goes to zero. This limit is the quotient of two functions, so we should be able to use the quotient rule for limits, right? Give that a shot. We have to be a little bit careful when we use the quotient rule for limits. If we try to plug in zero for x, we end up with the limit as x goes to zero something that's approximately 0 or 0. And whenever we have 0 divided by 0, the quotient rule doesn't work. So in this case, we can't use it. Right. We can't use that quotient rule here because this limit is of the form 0 divided by 0. The good next step is to try to graph the function to see if we can guess the answer from that graph. Well, here it is. So the limit seems to be 1, but how can we prove that? We're going to use the squeeze theorem. Now there are a few steps to this proof, but working through it is a great way to refresh some of your trig knowledge and work with the squeeze theorem. Now, because this is trig, a great place to start is the unit circle. 
let's call the angle we're interested in x, and let's measure everything in radians. There are three lengths here that we're going to need. Let's call them a, b, and c. Can you figure out what they are in terms of x? Let's start by looking at a. If you draw this right angle in here, we see that a is opposite the angle x in a right triangle. So we can write that the sine of x is equal to the opposite, which is a, over the hypotenuse, which is 1. So that means that a is equal to the sine of x. Next, we can take a look at b. b is the arc of a circle. So how do we find the length of the arc of a circle? Well, we know that if we measure things in radians, an angle, say x, is such equal to the arc length, b, divided by the radius. The radius here is 1, so this is just b. So b is just equal to x. Okay, last one. Let's take a look at c. c is the leg of a big right triangle. Let's draw this right triangle. That includes c as a leg. That's a hypotenuse. That's the leg. Now, x is an angle in that right triangle. If we take the tangent of x, it's equal to the opposite, which is c, over the adjacent, which is 1, which is equal to c. So c is equal to the tangent of x. Nice work. Next, let's calculate some of the areas in this figure. Once we have those areas, we'll be able to write down an inequality to help us use the squeeze theorem. So what's the area of this orange region here? The orange region is a triangle. The base here is the radius of the circle. You'll notice that it ends on a circle. That circle has radius 1, so the base is 1. So the area is 1 half times the base, which is 1, times the height, which we said is sine of x. Or 1 half sine of x. Great. Now try to find the area of this purple region. This is a fraction of the circle, so if you remember how to find the area of a circle, you can take a fraction of it to get this purple area. This purple area is a sector of a circle. The circle has radius 1 here. So the area of a total circle is going to be pi times the radius squared, but we only want a fraction of it. What fraction do we want? Well, this angle's x, and the total amount of angle in a circle is 2 pi. So the amount that we want is x over 2 pi of a full circle. Again, remembering that the radius here is 1, we're left with 1 half x. Last one. What's the area of this green right triangle? The green right triangle has legs 1 and tangent of x. The area of a right triangle is 1 half times leg 1 times leg 2, because the legs can be thought of as a base and a height. Leg 1 is 1, so I'll write that as 1 half times 1, and leg 2 is the tangent of theta, or the tangent of x here. Putting that together gives us an area of 1 half tangent of x. Excellent. Now we have these three areas, so we can write down inequality. What inequality do these areas satisfy? In other words, how can you arrange these areas from smallest to largest?
these areas are in this figure, and you'll notice that they're nested. So this orange area is strictly inside the purple area, which comes out here. So this area is less than or equal to the purple area. The green area totally covers the purple area, so it's bigger than it. So the order of areas is 1 half sine x, that's the orange one. That's less than or equal to 1 half x, that's the purple one. And that is less than or equal to 1 half tangent of x, which is the green area. Right. Let's cancel out the 1 half in each of these terms. And let's also divide everything by sine of x. That's fine as long as x isn't zero. And we're not worried about when x is zero, only when x is near zero. Sine x over sine x equals one, so let's simplify that. The expression in the middle looks a bit like the sine x over x that we're trying to find the limit of, but now it's sandwiched between these two other expressions. Let's see if we can squeeze it by taking the limit of everything. The limit on the left is one, since the number one doesn't change as x goes to zero. It's always just one. Try working out the limit on the right. Let's take a look at tangent of x over sine of x. We can write tangent of x as sine of x over cosine of x. And we can divide that whole thing by sine of x. If we simplify this, we're left with 1 over cosine of x. The sine of x's cancel out. Well, that's a little bit easier. What's the limit as x approaches 0 with 1 over cosine of x? Well, we can just plug in 0 for x, because the cosine of 0 is 1. This is 1 over 1, which is 1. Right, it's also 1. We've successfully squeezed this expression in the middle and found that it also has to be 1. If the limit as x goes to 0 of x over sine x is 1, then what's the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x? It seems like the limit of the reciprocal should be the reciprocal of the limits, but let's check it carefully using the quotient rule. Let's call x over sine of x f of x. So we know that the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x is 1 then what's the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over f of x? That would be x over sine of x. Well, we can use the quotient rule. This is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of 1, the numerator, divided by the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x, in the denominator. This limit is 1, and this limit is also 1. So it's not one of the bad cases for the quotient rule. And this total limit just comes out to 1 divided by 1, which is 1. Right. Sine x over x also approaches 1 as x goes to 0. Here's the graph that we made at the beginning. It was hard work getting this limit, but it can show up over and over again when dealing with trig functions. Often, by using trig identities, you can reduce limits with trig functions to some version of the limit of sine x over x. So this is a great one to remember. Nice work.